Eddie, you're dying. You have a condition called... Doesn't matter. You're not interested in what's killing you? You're smiling. No, I'm not. You dosed me! Coffee. They worked! A dying girl thought I was happy. She's miserable. She was no different than she'd ever been. House getting angry for Wilson, dosing him here is like Matt Hancock saying we should social distance, then having an affair with his assistant. Very excited to be reacting to House MD Season 3, Episode 22, Resignation. On this channel, we are reacting to all 177 House videos. This will be Episode 80. Let's see if we can get the diagnosis before House does as a doctor working in London. My fair! She almost took my head off. Addy, you're bleeding. <laughs> I never even hit her. Bleeding from the mouth with no trauma during a martial arts fight. Good luck getting a doctor to believe that. In the real world, I'd be incredibly suspicious of a nosebleed from the back of the nose here. Many of those nosebleeds can be associated with high blood pressure, so if she was susceptible and now bracing while doing her roundhouse kick, that could have popped a small vessel at the back of the nose. If that's true, then for every 10 mils we see in the mouth, there could be 100 mils going into the stomach. I once had a 57-year-old patient with high blood pressure come in with a massive posterior nosebleed in hospital, and I had to use a rapid rhino to stop it. It's essentially a giant inflatable tampon that you put in the back of someone's nose to compress the bleeding vessels and stop them. We usually leave them in for 24 hours and then slowly deflate them to allow the vessel to clot off. House may be many things, but common is definitely not one. So what else could this be? Well, coughing up blood from a rare cancer, vomiting up blood from the stomach because of a rare bleeding disorder, or maybe she was hit with a lead nunchuck last week and got heavy metal poisoning. Either way, we need more clues. Most likely she coughed it up. No fever, no elevated white count, which rules out infection. The bronchoscopy was pristine. So then the blood came from her stomach. With no occult blood in her stool. Which means it didn't come from anyone. Anyway. Now a good time. Sign here. I resigned. Hyperdynamic heart could force too much blood into her lungs. She coughed up the overflow. Foreman going to do a stress echo test to see if he's right. Chase just had less reaction to Foreman quitting than a London pigeon to danger. It's interesting that none of the usual sources of the bleeding could be found with the lungs, stomach and sinuses all being cleared and no drugs or toxins found in the blood. Chase's theory then is that the heart started pumping so much blood that the lung pipes exploded exploded, then miraculously repaired themselves. It's appropriate that this theory hurts my head because it holds about as much water as a strainer. What else could be causing the appearance of this mysterious blood? Assuming it isn't just from the mouth, which they haven't mentioned, it could be blood-tinged saliva from a tumor in her salivary glands. It would be a rare presentation as more commonly it would cause dry mouth, a lump that you could feel or even paralysis of the left side of the face. In theory though, it could go unnoticed and technically cause spitting up blood with all the other usual sources being negative. That usually presents in the 50s or 60s though with a smoking patient and someone who does martial arts may be more health conscious. Going down the same saliva route, it could be a condition called Sjogren's Syndrome, where your body classically attacks the tear ducts and salivary glands, causing them not to work. The Sahara mouth could be prone to bleeding, which would explain this presentation, and it's more common in slightly younger females than the cancer would be. It would fit very well, so it's gonna have to be my first diagnostic guess. So why are you leaving? I don't like you. Never have, never will. Whatever the real reason is, you're ashamed of it. Mary artery looks good. Are you cold? No. Addie has goosebumps. I think there's an infection. Infection likes nice wet places for lungs. Start treatment, get a lung biopsy. Lung biopsy? For infection? How about testing for atypical pneumonia like Legionella or mycoplasma in the blood and urine? How about taking a sputum to look at under a microscope or washings from the tube they just stuck in her lungs? No, 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 no. Let's take a little trip into Lung City and bring back the wall as a souvenir. This is house though, so let's assume that is the next best diagnostic decision. How does that fit in with getting goosebumps while hot? Well, goosebumps are our body's response to cold because they give our hairs an erection, making them stand on end. It is quite literally called piloerection, I'm not making this up. Those erect hairs trap a layer of air which keeps the heat in to try and warm you up. Usually that's to warm you to 37 degrees which is the usual body temperature when things drop a bit colder. You see that's the perfect temperature for us but it's also conveniently the perfect temperature for many bacteria and viruses as well. So if we have an infection then our hypothalamus sets our temperature higher to make those bugs feel less like they're in a lukewarm 
warm bath and more like a boiling kettle. Of course, there's a limit to that as if we make ourselves too hot, then our cells will also get damaged but it explains why we can get cold and get goosebumps when we're unwell, even if we're at normal temperatures. Ramping up your temperature isn't unique to humans though. Even some plants can increase their leaf temperatures when they have a fungal infection and cold blooded animals know to go sit on a hot rock when they have an infection as well. One study found that if you stop that process in desert iguanas, they're 75% more likely to die as a result of the infection. So maybe our patient is an iguana in human skin and ramping up her temperature to deal with infection. I'm not totally convinced though as with symptoms this vague, it's probably lupus. Question for you smart people, if fever helps fight infection, then does giving medication to drop it down cause infections to last longer? Answers down below. Why is Fulman quitting? He wants to breed llamas. You're ashamed of the reason too. She has diarrhea. From the antibiotics for the infection. Lung biopsy says she doesn't have an infection. She can't breathe. Pressure's collapsing her lungs. She's not getting any air. She couldn't breathe because she had a pleural effusion. Effusion was transudated. She needs an arteriogram. It is a shame that her lungs stopped working, but we have a new clue. A transudative pleural effusion. That means the fluid in the chest is more watery than thick and filled with pus, which is what we would call an exudative effusion. The causes of a transudative effusion are things like heart failure, liver failure, urinothorax, low thyroid hormone, or nephrotic syndrome. Urinothorax is an interesting one. You get urine leaking behind the kidney into what we call the retroperitoneal space and that then gets absorbed by our lymph vessels. The lymph then delivers it to the lungs and causes it to build up. Then when you pull a bit of fluid out from the lungs, it smells and looks exactly like urine. Pretty crazy. Another interesting thing could be a condition called Mike syndrome, where the patient has an ovarian tumor and develops an effusion in the lung alongside it. With her age and gender, she could definitely have an ovarian tumor that's causing this. I like that as a diagnosis, gonna be my second diagnostic guess. Maybe it's called resignation because she'll have to have her ovary removed and she only has one left from something else. So she'll need to resign to the fact that she'll never have kids. Oh, that would work so well here. It's about my bowel movements. You sure you wanna be here for this? We do everything together. Drop your pants, I'll suit up. They float. My bowel movements, we're vegans. Wow. Whatever floats your poop. To be a doctor, you have to get incredibly comfortable with many things like blood, pus, and our removable fudge tails. They come in all shapes and sizes to the point that we even have a chart that shows what they look like. Type three or four are pretty normal. Then as you get higher up, you're getting into diarrhea territory and lower into constipation. But what makes our rear oven cook up a floater? Well, usually two things in poop cause them to stay on the surface. The first is too much fat and the second is too too much gas. Vegan diets generally contain high fiber, which can create more gas during digestion and lead to floating poop. Interestingly, a major cause of this is a weight loss medication that has been used a lot called Orlistat. Some of my patients hate it as they're still consuming a high fat diet when they receive it. One of my patients was a 41 year old male said that when he tried it, the pill made him open his bowels unintentionally as he couldn't get to the toilet in time. Others think it works well, but it causes floating stools by blocking the exhaust absorption of fats in your gut, so they need to be excreted. It sounds like the diet is more the cause of this patient's symptoms though. Arteriogram was normal. Maybe she's missing a protein. Complement factor H deficiency. So we isolate the cells that are yummiest for it. Stick a needle in her eye. Complement factor H deficiency is a part of general complement deficiencies that are very important for immune activation. Their defects are caused by genetic inheritance and that can lead to susceptibility particularly to encapsulated organisms like Streptococcus pneumoniae and Haemophilus influenza, which can cause pneumonia. Complement deficiencies are around 5% of immune deficiencies in general, and antibody deficiencies are much more common with being 65% of immune deficiencies. Complement is important for killing bacteria for a few different reasons. They can help form a membrane attack complex, which is essentially a transformer produced by multiple proteins that penetrate the bacterial cell wall and cause it to burst. Another mechanism is when the protein attaches to the bacteria and allows it to be recognized by the immune system and destroyed called obstinization. The specific type that House thinks this patient has has no diagnostic test, so they've decided they want to poke her in the eye with a needle. Why? Because it makes for good television, that's why. You're cheating on honey. I get it. You're accomplished, you're funny. He's cheating with another food group. These floaters float because they're full of fat. 
probably had a big cheeseburger for lunch. You're disgusting. I'm funny. Macular biopsy was negative, which means you're wrong. There's no complement factor H deficiency. She needs an MRI of her brain. Her brain's clean. No tumor and no abscess. Man! Something tells me that an MRI scan isn't supposed to make your head open up like you've been in a Saw movie. The team think that proves that it isn't complement factor H deficiency and it's autoimmune. How still insist that it's infection because of that immunodeficiency? And I am just having extreme difficulty. You see, it's tough to diagnose a condition that almost certainly has never actually happened. How did her head just randomly explode in an MRI machine? She has no pus no tissue necrosis, there's no raised pressure in her brain that somehow burst through a one centimeter thick portion of skull. It was also at one of the thickest parts of the skull as well. See the average thickness of the occipital bone which seems to have burst open for her is eight millimeters. In the temporal area at the side, it's around five millimeters. Or maybe it's just burst through the soft tissue and not through the skull. So even if it were because of high pressure, it should have exploded through the temple rather than the back of the head. That just can't happen though because if the pressure builds up and things start getting crowded, which way are you gonna leave the room? Through the open door or the base of the skull or jump through the solid bone wall at the side? You can probably figure out that one by the lack of human shaped holes in the walls. If it's autoimmune, she can live but we have to give her steroids now before her heart ruptures. Dr. Stein said they're probably calcium deposits. Well, with your medical history, you don't wanna take any chances. You sure talk fast. This is nothing, you just see me when we're busy. I've never winked at a patient in my life. I have no idea, I am so sorry. I you dosed me. Aha, you yawned. I put you on uppers and you still yawned. Whoa, 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 did House just spike Wilson at work? just to prove that his yawning wasn't because of tiredness. I mean, House found his symptoms, so at least Wilson will know why he's yawning when he's sitting in prison for getting high on the job. In all fairness though, you could probably start a pharmacy from House's blood and he's still there, so I wouldn't worry too much. So what is yawning even useful for and how can it be dangerous? A yawn is an involuntary reflex that could happen when your blood needs more oxygen. When it happens excessively, it can be because of physical causes like general tiredness, fatigue, or vagus nerve overstimulation or emotional causes like anxiety, depression, or even their treatment with things like sertraline, escitalopram, or fluoxetine, commonly causing yawning. Could Wilson be on antidepressants in that case? Let's find out. Yawning is a side effect of some antidepressants, apparently the ones you're on. Mr. Well-adjusted is as messed up as the rest of us. It's personal. Yes. Why didn't you pick up the phone? Chase was wrong. Eddie's kidney shut down. Hemolytic uremic syndrome shut down Eddie's kidneys. Peripheral smear of red cells had schistocytes. Okay, it seems like Cameron assumed it was hemolytic uremic syndrome because of the kidney failure and schistocytes, which are fragmented blood cells. There are other conditions that could cause it, but I agree that HUS does fit best. It's generally caused by a particularly nasty type of E. coli, which is 0157, but can be caused by Shigella as well. Usually patients with that have bloody diarrhea first, which triggers the condition. I remember when I was on pediatrics, one summer the ward was completely empty. There was just one poor child left who had been with us for around three to four months. He was six years old and got this infection that left him in kidney failure and caused brain damage because of it. His parents had waited to bring him in as they thought he would just get better at home, but unfortunately he became unresponsive eventually, at which point it was too late to avoid the damage. Definitely don't take risks with children as they are very vulnerable. With our patient here though, this is making houses guess more likely as without an immune system, this patient could be vulnerable to that E. coli infection. On the bright side, it confirms my diagnosis. I called it based on coughing blood. She's going to die. Her heart went into V-fib. Brought her back. Barely. You have your confirmation. Eddie, you're dying. You have a condition called... Doesn't matter. You're not interested in what's killing you? You're smiling. No, I'm not. You dosed me. Coffee. They worked. A dying girl thought I was happy. She's miserable. She was no different than she'd ever been. 
House getting angry for Wilson dosing him here is like Matt Hancock saying we should social distance, then having an affair with his assistant. One glaringly obvious thing here that I have to address is antidepressants don't just work after one spike in the coffee. They usually take six weeks minimum to begin noticing the effect. Even if it was at maximum dose, it wouldn't make House so hopped up on serotonin that he could smile while breaking news of a patient's lethal diagnosis. But is that diagnosis correct? They haven't confirmed it with any tests and it seems like House just had a eureka moment. He said she's no different to how she's always been. What could that mean? What if it isn't primary immunodeficiency syndrome? What else could knock out her body's defenses this badly? HIV. Not only would it explain all her symptoms, but also the mood disturbance and why she's submitted to resignation so much. Maybe she got it while engaging in not so savory practices and didn't want to admit that to the team while her nice parents were around. That has to be my final diagnostic guess. It would be insane if it's that, but question for you smart people, what is the most common method of HIV transmission? Answers down below. Need a minute with your daughter. Four. She's gonna live. I get out. You tried to kill yourself by throwing down kitchen cleanser. You wrapped it in gel caps or gum that burned a hole in your intestine. The bridge allowed the bacteria an entrance to the artery. Can you fix me? Take about two hours. Psychotherapy's gonna take a little longer. Well, there you have it. Encapsulated kitchen cleanser blowing a hole in the intestine to allow bacteria to slowly seep into the bloodstream. I must have missed that lecture. What I find very interesting here is that this was essentially an attempt for her to end her life, but now after it happened, she wants to get better. Thankfully, only 5% of people who attempt to end their life are successful and the vast majority regret their decision. Unfortunately, a significant number are still successful though. In the US, it's actually the 10th leading cause of death, and one in 100 global deaths is by the person ending their own life. It is preventable though, some of that is through culture and communities, but much of it will come from healthcare and support that countries offer. That includes strengthening economic support, improving access to mental health services, creating protective environments, helping people create meaningful connections, teaching, coping, and problem-solving skills, and finding people at high risk and lessening that risk by focusing on the person, especially after an attempt. Hopefully that would be enough to stop Addy from going for round two. Why'd you do it? I've just never been happy. This isn't a job interview, is it? I'm on antidepressants, I eat meat, I like drugs, and I'm not always faithful to the woman I date. You told the truth. Well, how miserable can you be saving lives, sleeping around and doing drugs? You could be extremely miserable doing that. Saving lives is rewarding, but in reality, there's never a big I saved a life moment. It's generally a team of you that did it. And usually if you fix someone, you tend to never see them again. So you end up seeing the patients that you didn't fix, which leads you to have a biased perspective of how effective your treatments are. That can be one of the most challenging parts of being a doctor. We know internally that we're doing good, but there isn't much external validation if you're into that. As for doing drugs, we know that that can give you a short burst of satisfaction, but with longer term, higher rates of depression and anxiety. Casual sex with multiple partners has been shown to have similar effects in some people, but it depends whether it's against their moral code or not. One study found that the effect of casual encounters depends on the reason for it. If it was for themselves, then it had no effect on their mental well-being. If it was for non-autonomous reasons like being drunk or wanting a relationship with the person or trying to get revenge on an ex, then that could negatively impact their well-being. In all studies, there are no gender differences of this impact between males and females though. This episode was pretty solid overall with no outstanding areas. I'd say 6.5 out of 10 for entertainment. 6 out of 10 accuracy and 6 out of 10 diagnosis. It doesn't make full sense until you watch this previous one where an African-American cancer patient can't find a marrow match here.